know that adding a service on at the beginning kind of makes it long to set. Um, so deep breaths, deep breaths. I'll preach as long as the Holy Spirit wants me to preach. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll try to be, and I'll try to re listen to him and not to my own uh, own intuitions. Is that like the Christian saying, I'll, "I'll pray for it, I'll pray about it." <laughs> <laughs> that means like there's no chance. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, if you have your Bibles, please open to First John, <laughs> chapter three. We are going to be starting in verse ten, and we are actually going to be reading down through the end of the chapter so it's wow, really? quite a lengthy section now listen we're not going to get through it all but i am i am going to it's all a unit here so this is part one so buckle up for part <laughs> one here uh, it definitely is part one because i do have uh, another sermon on this section here uh, uh in verse 10 hear god's holy and inspired word it says by this it is evident who are the children of god and who are the children of the devil whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who, do, who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for, uh, for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know we are the truth, we are of the truth, and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything beloved if our heart does not condemn us we have confidence before god our heart does not condemn us we, sorry we have confidence before god and whatever we ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him and this is the commandment that we believe in the name of the lord jesus christ and love one another just as he has commanded us Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us and the spirit whom he has given us. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you uh, for the time that we've had to worship you and to sing our songs of praise and thanksgiving to you. And now I pray, Lord, that you would bless us again with your presence in the message of this word that you would lay upon my heart the things that you want us as a congregation to know out of this. I pray for the filling of the Spirit to indwell me, that I might speak words of truth. Once again, we pray for Joyce and Rhonda. We pray, God, for their quick recovery and healing. And Lord, we pray that you would just anoint this place by your Spirit, set up your angels as guard around us, along with your Spirit, and cast out all evil so that we might focus in and enjoy your, your word and your, and your comfort, Lord. And I pray uh, that you would do this by the power of your blood and by the power of the Spirit. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I've mentioned many times in the past, and please forgive me for mentioning it again, is I was trained in evangelism explosion. There are a myriad of ways to share your faith and learn how to share your faith. And there are different schools out there. You have Ray Comfort School, and you have Share Jesus Without Fear, and you have Evangelism Explosion. And I've been through a number of these, but the one that I was trained in, actually where I went to school, and you got the books, and you went through the whole thing, was Evangelism Explosion. 
And one of the things that they did in Evangelism Explosion was to ask these diagnostic questions. And the diagnostic questions were, you know, to show, ask you, well, well, where are you spiritually when you're talking to an unbeliever or you're talking to somebody who you don't know? Where are you spiritually? And those diagnostic questions were, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you would go to heaven or do you think that's something you're still working on? And the other question is, is if you were to die today and you were to stand in front of God, and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would be your response to that? And given that you, you know, the response that you get from the unbeliever kind of lets you know where they are, what they think about themselves, what they think about God, then a springboard into being able to preach and defend the gospel, which is all well and good. But the question comes down to, and what we're going to be dealing here in these verses is what happens when you know the right answers? Right? Like, I know the answers to those questions. I know the right answer. And one of the things that absolutely blew me away is when I went to Dallas, Texas to the discipleship training school, and I stayed there for a while, and we went out and we did evangelism. I dealt with unbelievers who, I dealt with, let's say, I dealt with unsaved people who knew all the right answers. That was amazing to me. I'd never dealt with that. I mean, I'd lived here in Utah since the time I was seven years old is when I first moved here to Utah. And the, the heretics are, are, and the unsaved people are the people over in the building with the bad theology. They don't know the right answer to those questions. They, they're over there and you ask them and you get a bad answer back. But I was asking people uh, who knew the right answers who were raised in Southern Baptist churches, who were raised in Assemblies of God churches, who were raised in all these different churches, and they knew, oh, I trust Jesus. And you're like, well, that there's something wasn't clicking. There was something wrong with them. I knew that I was dealing, on occasion, I knew that I was dealing with somebody who knew the right theological answer, but didn't have the Lord Jesus or surrender to the Lord Jesus as Lord of their lives. And that caused me to ask the question internally, which I've asked myself many a times is, how do I know that I'm saved? I can't simply point to my actions. I can't simply point to my belief or my faith or my theology. I know the answers to all those, and that's good. You know the answers to the questions. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I've received him as Lord and Savior. Da -da 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 -da. You know, repeat the Westminster Confession standards or the London Baptist standards or, you know, what you grew up on, and then you know the answer. And the second uh, question beyond that is, well, am I living it out? Am I acting like that? And I look at myself and I say, well, yeah, to a degree, of course, there's indwelling sin in my life. Uh, as we all have, and but you know, I help move the chairs at church, and now I'm in a position of ministry, and I can look to a lot of things I do. But you see, that isn't even the final answer. See, we must move from action to affection. That's the only way to know for sure if you are a true believer in Christ in and of yourself. Is not your theology, which is a big step forward for sure, is not simply your actions which is a big step forward for sure, but it's also your affections. Has God birthed in you a spirit that makes you love the brothers in a way that you were not capable of loving before and love God in a way that you were not capable of loving before? And that's what's before us today in these, in these paragraphs is a test to know whether or not I'm truly saved that I can ask because I can I can fool the world and he's going to talk here a little bit about don't be like Cain who did fool the world fooled everybody everybody thought he was a good idea don't be like him don't be like Judas as I've said before when they were around the table at the last supper and he says one of you will betray me none of them went well is it Judas and says yeah him it's got to be him he, he looked good on the outside it says don't be like Cain but love one another and this is how we tell it goes from action to affection and as we've seen before john moves from light to love those are the two realms from light and truth to love now i'm not going to give a big sermon on love at this point i'm going to save 
a majority of what I have to say for John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, because that's the culmination of what he says about love, because that's the source of our love, where he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that does not love does not know God, because God is love. And those are his two foundational pillars. As he said in the beginning, God is light and God is love. Are you walking in the truth and are you walking in love? And those are the two tests that he lays down before us. What is love? Love is an action, but it is also an affection. Now, I get it. I understand. And we are called to love. This is a command for us to love. And this is how we tell. Look at verse 10 here in this passage. It says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Love is a command and it's a command not just of action, but it's a command of the heart. This actually shows Jesus' total lordship over you. One particular atheist said, said that Christianity is the worst of all religions because not only does it command you what to do, it commands you how to feel. I understand that love's an action and sometimes it's a choice. Sometimes you go like, I don't feel like doing the right thing. I don't feel like doing the loving thing, but I'm going to love anyway by doing something. But let me tell you, that can be empty. You can do all the right things and it not count for anything. This is what was mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn there for just a moment. And it makes no sense to say love is just an action. It is an action for sure, but it is not just an action. And it makes no sense to say that. It would, it would empty this verse out of its meaning here. But notice here in verse 13, or chapter 13, in verse 1, it says, If I speak in the tongue of man and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong our crying symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith, so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver my body up to be burned, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Do you hear the severity of what he's saying there? This is the severity of what he's saying. He's saying, I can do the right thing. I can have the right action and not have love. Love is an affection of the heart joined with right action. And Jesus is so sovereign over you and so sovereign over this world that he not only commands your actions, but he commands your heart. He says, I want you to love. It is a commandment that we are given. Love is also in this, in this verses here seen as our assurance. Look here in verse, uh, look, look here again in verse uh, 14. It says, we know that we have passed out of death. Sorry, back to John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter uh, 3. It says, we know that we have passed out of death unto life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life. And skip down to verse 19. By this, we shall know that we are the tr are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. How do we reassure our hearts before him? How do we know that we are in, in Christ for real? Is our love for the brothers present, a present reality? Is our affection called to such a way that we, we would not be able to generate that in, our un, in an unsaved state? you know that you've been born again. It is your assurance before God. It's not only your assurance before God, it's your reassurance before God. It's your confidence, it's your assurance towards yourself, but it's your reassurance towards God. Again, in verse 19, it says, by this we shall know that we are the truth and reassure our hearts before him for whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence. What does this love give us? It gives us confidence so that we can go into the presence of God and ask anything in his name and it will be done for us. We are called to love. 
We are called to love because it's a command that God places on our hearts. We are called to love because it's our assurance within ourselves and it gives us confidence towards God. And we are called to love sacrificially. We are called to love sacrificially. Look at this in verse 16. We are called to follow our master. It says, by this, we know love that he laid down his life for us. Now he's going to ask us to do the same thing here in just a second and more than material, more than in just a, uh, a laying down our life sort of way. But I find it interesting. Look at verse 16. It says, by this, we know love. In other words, this is how love comes to us. This is how we understand love. This is everything that love has to say to us. By this, we know love. You want to know love objectively. You want to know love outside yourself. You want to know that God loves you. He says that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And how do we lay down our lives for our brothers? Well, sacrificially, we follow what Jesus did. Yes, we're called to lay down our lives for others, if we're called to that, very few will be called to do that. I just don't think that I mean, maybe in the future, who knows. Throughout time, it's certainly been the case. But over the course of the American history, very few have been called to lay down their lives. But we are called that even in that extreme circumstance of showing love to our brothers, we're called to lay down our life. If God calls us to do that, we're called to lay down our lives for our brothers. We're called to do something like if... Christianity becomes illegal and somebody comes in here with guns and says, well, in an, and I throw you all in another room. And I say, well, just nobody turned out today. I'm called to lay down my life for you and you and you for me. I'm called to do that if it comes to that. Now, I might shoot back, you know, and somebody's going to die first, but I, <laughs> I, might, I, I am called to lay down my life in love or I might be called to be a martyr I don't know it just depends on what the Lord would put on my heart during that time and by the way if I ever had to put you in the other room and say that no one was here I would lie and I would be as creative and as try to lie as well as I could I've been through that that whole thing whether it's okay to lie in that situation I believe the Bible absolutely says 100% yes it's you if it comes down to life life takes priority and just like Rahab with the spies who lied and in the book of James is commended for her lie. She is commended for her lie. It says she'd be like her because she spent, sent the spies out another way. That's not an excuse to lie all the time. And I'm getting off on a rabbit trail here. But just to let you know, in that situation, I would definitely lie and give up my life for you given the fact that I didn't get, I didn't cower out or something like that. You know, the flesh didn't, didn't, uh, didn't get, get me. But not only are we called to love sacrificially in laying down our lives, but we're also called to love sacrificially in laying down our goods, our tithing, our time, everything that God calls us to should be an act of love. In verse 16, again, it says, by this we know that, he laid down his life for us. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for others, for our brothers. But if anyone has, but, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, and yet he closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? See, so if you see a brother or a sister in need, you're supposed to lay down your life for them. You're supposed to not just lay down your life, but lay down your goods, lay down your services for that other person as far as need is concerned. Now, let me just say a few things here. We're called to love all people, but we're called to love the brothers and sisters in particular. Okay, you're supposed to go extra for your family and you're in a new family of God. And we're, go, we're called to do, go beyond for, for, the, for our family. Now, this is needs. This is in everything. Okay, this is needs here. This is food, shelter, clothing, maybe transportation, what you would need in any society to live. Okay, this isn't, you know, I, I, I'm behind on my bills because, you know, we bought HBO Max this month and now I can't 
you know, and now I, I, now we're having a hard time, you know, buying food. We're not called to promote laziness. We're not called to promote anything like that, but we are, but you have to be the judge of that in yourself. Okay. You can't use, well, that person's lazy to not give if God's, if God's calling you to give. Remember, there's law and there's grace, law and grace, law and grace, law and grace. I remember walking by a homeless person one time and I, I bought him some lunch. I bought this person. This is something I do fairly regular, fairly regularly. Most homeless people I meet are homeless on purpose. And the thought ran through my mind. The thought ran through my mind. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. I could have just said no. Nah. No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to promote that. And then I thought to myself, yes, that's law. That's law. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. But what would grace want me to do at this time? Even though he is violating the law, and, I, and in one sense I shouldn't do it, am I going to get the opportunity to share the gospel with this person because I bought him the meal when he, didn't, you know, when he should have been working? So this is something I'm going to leave it to you. You have to judge in your mind. You have to judge each individual circumstance in your mind. You know, whether or not I'm feeding into this person's laziness or whether or not God's calling me to a position of grace or whether or not this person truly has a need. Now, if this person truly has a need, there's no question about it. But there can be a situation where you can just be stingy with money and just not want to give. And then the excuse of this, this, and this says, well, I'm not going to do that for them. But the, the motivation behind the excuse is, well, I'm kind of stingy with my money, so I don't want to give. You see, you have to, you have to look in it yourself and say, what's going on here? But you are called to give, particularly give sacrificially to your brothers, even if your life depends upon it. That's how we are supposed to love, and that is how we know that we have passed from death to life. Now, let me say for just a minute how not to love. Because the command here is given, don't do this. Okay, It's the command, do this, but then there's the command, don't do this. So that's that command is given here as well. Look here in verse 11 once again. It says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and a murderer of his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Okay, so we are not called to be like Cain. Now, of course, we're not going to be like Cain if we're truly born again. And this might cause you to ask the question, well, then why does he say this to a group of people who are mostly born again if they're going to do this anyway, if they're going to love one another because that's what God's seed does, that's what God's spirit does in the life of that person. God gives negative examples to the people of God because it takes effect in us. Okay, it takes effect in us. It's a deterrent. The true Christian will look at the deterrent, not just the positive command. It's not a bad thing to look at the deterrent. Somebody asked me, we think of the biggest deterrent of all, going to hell. I don't want to go to hell, okay? All right? I'm not some type of less Christian because I don't want to go to hell. I'm not like, okay, as well, you know, why did you believe in Jesus Christ and stuff? I actually heard this from a pastor, and I've slipped into this too. He'd say like, well, not going to hell is the worst reason why you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In other words, you should accept Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because you're going to serve him and you're going to be with him and you're going to do all this stuff. And I thought to myself, that's all well and good, but I can't take my personal fear of hell out of it. I don't want to go to hell. And part of what's the good news is, is this is why it's good news, is you, don't, is you should get all that good stuff for sure, but you don't have to go to hell. That's, that's the good, that's part of the good news. God's judgment which we call in the final sentence, hell, does not have to be applied to you because of what Jesus did. That's the good news of the gospel, is you get to escape God's judgment based on the work of another person. So God gives these things to us as deterrents so that we can go, oh, I'm not going to be like that. I don't want to be like that. And it takes effect in the true Christian. How should we not be like Cain? Think about Cain for a minute. And I want you to think of several things about him. 
and things that he did in his life that we shouldn't be like. Number one, Cain was deceptive. We shouldn't be like Cain in the, in the sense that Cain looked righteous, but he really wasn't righteous. As a matter of fact, the word Cain means a choir or spear. It, 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 it means it's a very odd meaning. And if you look back in the Old Testament, the majority and weight of the evidence seems to be that they thought Cain was going to be the deliverer. They really thought Cain was going to be the, the, the one who was going to set them free. Because his name means to, it's a weird name. It means to like acquire a spear. And so why would you acquire a spear? They might have thought, well, we just got this promise from God that one's going to come and crush the head. And she says, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And in all likelihood, they thought he was going to be a deliverer. Talk about a disappointment, right? I mean, some parents have been disappointed <laughs> by their children. What a disappointment that been. Not only did he not, but he looked righteous. We shouldn't be like Cain in our outward appearance, just merely looking righteous. We've dealt with that. I know you've all dealt with that with people who look right, but inside they are corrupt. Cain had a bad heart, which caused him to do bad things. He had an unregenerate heart. A lot of people look at the fruit of what he did, which, I'll, which I will get to momentarily, his sacrificial offering of what he did, and say, that's why God didn't accept it. But that's only part of the story. They'll say that's why God didn't accept it because it was a bad offering. But that's not really the case. Cain had a bad heart and therefore he made a bad offering. Turn back with me to Genesis. All the way back to Genesis. It's in the G's. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> right by Galatians. Chapter 4. And in verse 4, or, or actually chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now Cain, now Adam knew his wife, uh, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore another Abel. By the way, the word Abel means a breath, and it's kind of a derivative term. This is like Bar Boromir and Faramir. Here. This is like, it's, he might as well be named like so-and-so, kind of. You know, Cain, the acquired of the Lord, the acquired spear of God, and Abel, so-and-so. There's Boromir and Faramir here. And it says, in verse 2, it says, And again, she bore his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering in the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock, the fat portions. And listen, listen to this very carefully. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. See, that's the flip side. See, he had regard for Abel and his offering, and he didn't have regard for Cain or his offering. You see, it wasn't, mm. we're not given the details of what was, of what was a ready sacrifice back then, but I'll tell you this, whether or not that was, later on there were grain sacrifices in the Old Testament, whether or not that was instituted back then, we're just not given that. But I'll tell you this, he had a bad heart. And as a result of that bad heart, he wanted religion on his own terms. Don't be like Cain. Don't be somebody who it looks outwardly righteous. Don't be somebody who wants religion on his own terms, who wants a religion without blood. And the result was is that he murdered his brother. And the result of Cain and his offspring in this world, that spiritual offspring, that was the result that, that was the, the, the spiritual motivation of Cain, not the result. Okay, let me just pause there and say something. Cain was the product of Adam and Eve, just so you know. Okay, there's a theory out there saying that Cain was the product of, of, uh, of Eve and Satan. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the spiritual motivation behind uh, Cain was certainly satanic, and it's still here in this world today. And what does he say here in verse 13? If you skip back to John chapter 3 and verse 13, he says, don't be like Cain. He was a murderer. And then in verse 13, he says, do not be surprised. 
do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. You see, the controversy between Cain and Abel, the controversy between the sons of God and the sons of the evil one, the controversy between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, it's old, it's serious, and it's spiritual. And if graces are removed, they would kill you. This is why, this is why I believe a, a Christian should never marry a non-Christian, ever. There's never an excuse. You are marrying someone, yes, there are common graces, not everybody's as bad as they could be because of common grace, but you are, mer you are merging yourself, your life, with somebody who has the potential to murder you if all graces were removed. You can't yoke yourself to somebody who love with somebody who loves God and somebody who the Bible says hates God. And they hate God. Don't be like Cain. Don't be like Cain. And why did he murder him? Did Abel do anything wrong? No. He 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 murdered him because Abel did the right thing and Cain did the wrong thing. And he just couldn't handle that. He just couldn't handle that enmity, that seeing God bless somebody. The evilness of his own heart rose up and murdered him. Don't be like that. We see an example of this. I won't have you turn there, but you know the story in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus is getting onto his public ministry and uh, he's becoming famous and he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. <clears throat> And in his hometown of Nazareth, they're like, okay, you've, you know, you've been out, you've been on the circuit, you've been preaching, you've been, you know, let's hear what you have to say. And he speaks pretty good for a while. They all seem to be, uh, they all seem to be uh, enjoying what he has to say. And then they kind of say, well, you know, do what you did over there. Because we've heard you doing miracles, do what you did here. And he wasn't the puppet on command. He wasn't the, oh, I'm just going to do what you ask me to do. I'm going to do my own thing. And what happened? They rose up and they went to throw him off a cliff. That hatred there is seen best in, in Israel, of all places. That hatred toward their Messiah is seen among the people of God in all places. This is why he's warning the church here. Among the people of God, you are going to have people who actually hate you and could murder you and get away with it. And I hate, I don't like to keep bringing this guy up. I won't say his, his name, but you've all heard me talk about him. But I swear to you, I swear to you, listen, I was in a meeting with that guy. I was in a meeting with that guy who claimed to be a Christian. And it was me and the pastor of that church. And I, and I could feel, and I'd see it in his eyes, that if he could get away with it, he would kill me. I could see it in his eyes because he didn't like what I was saying. And I was only telling him the truth. I wasn't trying to be mean to him. I'm not saying I did everything perfectly in that situation. But as far as me and God are concerned, I was telling him, look, this is what we really think about you. You are, not, you are here to disrupt the body. And I promise you, I say it with all sincerity, this guy who is a leader at a church, at a Baptist Reformed church, looked me in the eye and I could see it. I almost asked, I almost asked, if, there was, asked if there was a demon there. I almost did. I almost said, is there, is there, there's a demon there, come forth. I almost did that. But I could see in his eyes a murderous look, mm -hmm. almost a look like I, I would just kill you if I could. That, that, that existed in the people of God in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, and it exists here. Not that they're saved, don't misunderstand me. They're not saved, because it says nobody who is saved is going to have that. But among the outward congregation, even in leadership, you can have people who want to kill you, just like they wanted to, just like the leader of the synagogue wanted to kill the Messiah. So it's old, it's serious, and it's spiritual. What happens? Let me ask you that. Let me finish with this. I'm going to finish on a few points here. Obviously, we walk around, and not everybody who's a non safe person wants to kill us, right? I mean, not always. We've been there, but you know what I mean? <laughs> What, what, what's going on there? Let me give you, let me give you three points and then I'm going to wrap this up or three kind of life lessons. When, when it, why is it not always the case 
that's that a Christian wants to be murdered by a non-Christian, okay, or why the world doesn't have this vehement hate all the time. Number one, as we all know, not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. So especially when you get down like the heart of Texas and stuff like that, you know what I mean? You got somebody who's like, well, I go out with my friends and he's my best friend and he doesn't want to kill me. Well, not everybody who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. Just because you go to a church doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. That's one, one thing. The second thing is, is you might be hiding your light. You might be putting your light under a bushel. Unfortunately, I got to say, I've been guilty of that a few times. I've been guilty of not speaking up when I know I should speak up. I've been guilty of being a coward. I've, I've had to repent of that many times. It's interesting that on the first list of people to go to hell are the cowardly. The cowardly. That's, I mean, you get down into some awful stuff there, but, you know, the very first list is the cowardly. It's like, why that? Well, because there's, there's just a special place in hell for people who know the truth and don't and and choose not to say anything or choose not to believe it and i've met people before we've talked to missionaries before mormons before who say things like well i i believe you but man that would just destroy my business i'd lose my family i'd lose this i'd lose that the cowardly afraid of this world are the first to enter into hell so you could be hiding your light and it needs to be repented of it's something christians do we need not to but the other thing is, and this is the, probably the, the, the biggest part, is you just don't have the opportunity yet. I mean, there is a common grace given to this world because of the uh, prevail, uh, prevailing nature of the gospel that we are living in a time of great common grace. It seems to be waning in my day. It seems to be waning at this time. I'm not sure. But we're living in a, in, in a, in a time of, of super common grace where you can go and you can be a Christian and maybe what the world will ask you to do is turn off your Christian music. It's like, we don't like that at work here. That's, you know, that, that kind of stuff can still happen, but it's just not the, the right time. It's not the right opportunity. But let me assure you, when all that's stripped away and it becomes the right opportunity and you stand up for the right issues, when the whole world is telling you not to do it and you stand up, you, you will be hated by all. You will be hated by all. One of the things that's interesting when they talk about this, you read the Bible, is it says that the Herodians... The Herodians and the Pharisees got together to kill, to, to plot to kill Jesus. Do you know how, that's like saying the Republicans and the Democrats got together to kill, to, they, they couldn't be too further on the theological and, 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 and sociological perspectives than to say the Herodians and the Pharisees got together. The people who were loyal, the Jews who were loyal to Herod, and the Jews who were, uh, who were Pharisees got together. Then the Sanhedrin got together to kill Jesus. You see, they're united against Christ. They are united against him. And we just may have not had that opportunity yet. Will that opportunity come? I pray not in my lifetime. I pray not in your lifetime either. I pray... I know, I know this, I know based on biblical prophecy that one day Satan will be released from his chain and, and, the, and there will be a final Antichrist and Christianity. And you read Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses, they will destroy those two witnesses and they will lie in the grave for three days, but they'll come back. And that's to get, get into big symbolism there. But that's you and me. That's the church. They're not, it's not Moses and Elijah. It's not, it's not the law and the prophets. The two witnesses are the church, and the two witnesses are destroyed for a short time and then come back to life. Read, read Revelation chapter 11. Get the, get the tape on that, or the tape, the video on that. So let me encourage you, in closing, let me encourage you. Let your light shine. Love one another. Love one another the way that we're supposed to love. It's a command. It's our assurance. We're called to love sacrificially. And don't be like Cain, who hated his brother for no reason other than he was righteous. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. I pray, God, that whatever season of life we move into, whatever season of political turmoil we move into, that we would continue to advance the gospel, that we would continue to proclaim your name, that we would continue to show the world that we are Christians by our love for one another and our love for you and our love for the truth. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As always, you can come and take, and let's go back to our seats and pray.